Thanks very much. I'm here this morning to talk about the idea of evolutionary software architectures. It turns out this is one of those problems that has bugged us for a long time in software architectures. How do you build systems that you can easily change over time? In fact, for a long time, the colloquial tongue-in-cheek definition of software architecture was the stuff that's hard to change later. But then we started building microservices and similar architectures where the concept of change was built into the architecture. And Rebecca, Pat, and I realized that that's not unique to microservices. This is a characteristic that you can build into architectures. Uh, and that's exactly what this talk is about, is how do you build architectures that you can gracefully change over time. So you've got some sort of problem, and you decided to solve it by writing software. So you have requirements of some kind. We don't really care how you got these requirements. Things we're talking about are essentially orthogonal to process. But this is not the only thing you have to think about as an architect. You also have to think about all these other things, like performance and scalability, and maybe legality if you're dealing with medical records or sensitive data or something like that. And in fact, this is really the craft of software architectures. Given this set of requirements and all these other concerns, what is the best design that balances or trades off all these things to the best of our ability? This is why you hear the word trade-off so often associated with software architecture, because almost never can you maximize all these things. Uh, for example, if I want to increase security, I almost certainly decrease performance, because I have to do more on the fly encryption, more indirection for secrets hiding. And so this is really the craft of software architectures. Given all these characteristics, how can I create a design that balances these things the best possible way? The other problem, of course, but there are lots of these things we could support. This is a partial list from Wikipedia, but it'll always be a partial list because uh, my co-author Rebecca talks about a system that she worked on several years ago where the goal was to build a centralized architecture, but uh, every time they produced a design, the client said, but what happens if we lose Scotland? Because it turns out several years ago there had been a freak communication accident where they'd lost communication to their Scottish stores, so that became one of their overriding concerns on architecture is communication to the Scottish stores. And so they started uh, referring to this as Scotlandility as a characteristic of their architecture. So what happens if we lose Scotland? We have to build that into our architecture. So you'll always be able to invent new things to prioritize in software projects. These are, of course, called the illities of software architecture because so many of these end in illity. What we're proposing is to add yet another entry to this list, which is this idea of evolvability. But what does that really mean to have an evolvable software architecture? Well, let's say that you've chosen performance as a really important characteristic in your architecture. Having an evolvable architecture means that as your system changes, Performance doesn't change, particularly in a negative way. And so in many ways, evolvability is sort of a meta characteristic of architecture because it's wrapping all the other important characteristics and trying to preserve them over time. One of the misconceptions I think architects have had too long is that we've been treating architecture like an equation to be solved. And if we can ever solve the equation one time, we'll be done with it, can walk away. But it's always this thing that's slipping and sliding through time, and we have to accommodate this idea of time and architecture. And so of evolvability is this idea of once we've identified important architectural characteristics, how can we preserve the importance of those characteristics over time as change occurs? But change is interesting for us, because we normally think of change as just one big thing. But for us, particularly in the architecture world, it's really two different related kinds of things. It's business-driven change, and it's technology-driven change. So business-driven change are things like changing requirements, where you build requirements based on one set of factors, and then the market changes, or your business changes, and you have to change requirements. Or maybe you merge with another company and you have to take on all their workflows and all their business concerns. And this is, in fact, the thing that we've been focusing on for the past 20 years or so in agile software development is how do we get better and better at managing this kind of business or domain-driven change as it occurs. And we're gradually getting better and better at that over time. The kind of change we've been less good at handling is the technology-driven change, the kind of change that happens to us whether we want it to or not. 
And part of the reason that is so difficult for us is because of the nature of the software development ecosystem. So if you think about all the tools and frameworks and best practices and approaches and all the things that we know about building software up until about 10 minutes ago, that is the software development ecosystem. And that's basically where we all live and work on a regular basis. And it's an equilibrium, meaning it makes sense and the pieces fit together. But it's also extremely dynamic. We characterize this ecosystem in our book as what we call a dynamic equilibrium, meaning that while it's stable, it may fundamentally shift at any time without telling you. And a great example of this is when Docker hit our ecosystem a few years ago. Once Docker hit our ecosystem, it fundamentally changed our ecosystem forever. Even if you're not using Docker yet, it changes the kinds of decisions you can now make against that ecosystem because this whole new set of capabilities has appeared all of a sudden and is part of our world. And this constantly happens to us over and over again. One of the roles I have is the conference co-chair for the O'Reilly Software Architecture Conference that does uh, three iterations a year. At the end of every one of those conferences, the O'Reilly marketing people come to me and say, OK, Neil, tell us what the next big thing in architecture is going to be next year. And I always tell them, I have no idea. Because the way that's going to come about is one small change will trigger another small change, which will trigger another small change. And fractally, it will shift the entire ecosystem in a direction that we probably never could have anticipated before. But this creates some real challenges because it doesn't take a very astute observer to realize that everything changes all the time in our world. But this creates some real problems for some roles in architecture who are mandated with doing long-term strategic planning. But how is long-term planning possible when everything in your world can suddenly change in unexpected ways? I've literally been traveling all over the world for the last year or so. I've been talking to many of our clients and many of the enterprise architects and our clients. And I've been asking them all the same question, and none of them have had a good answer for me. So maybe today, finally, someone in this room has a good answer for this question, which is, can you tell me with great certainty exactly what JavaScript web framework you'll be using two years from now? And of course you can't, because it probably hasn't been written yet. How is long-term planning possible in a world like that? And of course, the answer is it's not. But why are we trying to do all that long-term planning? Well, you know, change is really expensive and difficult. And if we, change, if we plan just right, we can mitigate the expense and difficulty of that change. But what if you built your architecture with the notion of change built in, with the expectation that we're probably going to be using a different JavaScript web framework two years from now, and build that awareness into your architecture, now you don't have to build a better and better crystal ball. You can adapt to the change as it happens because you know it's going to happen. So we definitely set out writing the book with this idea of preserving architectural characteristics over time. But it turns out that it heavily overlaps another thing that's common in architecture. So one of the things that we wanted to do in our book, which has some pretty abstract ideas in it, is make them concrete by giving examples. All three of us work professionally as consultants, and so we harvested our examples from our professional life and created a fake company to cast all these examples against called Penultimate Widgets. Now, this is sort of a, a play on the English word uh, penultimate. Uh, many people think it means awesome because it has the word ultimate in it, but it actually means next to last. So I actually knew a company that was called Penultimate Consulting, unfortunately calling themselves next to last consulting, uh, which was a, sort of an odd mixed message. So that's the name of our fake company in our book. But this actually happened to me for one of our clients. I met one of our clients who's in the process of replatforming their system. And they had a bunch of aspirational goals they had identified for the next version of their platform. And there were 66 of them. And I remember this so well because they showed them to me in a spreadsheet that had 66 rows in it. And I said, you know, it's awesome that you delineated all these things you want in the next version of your architecture. But when I show up in six months, how many of these things are still going to be true? And maybe more importantly, how easily can you tell me how many of these 66 things are still true? 
This is an example of what's referred to as the second order effect. We very much set out toward this idea of protecting architectural characteristics over time, but then realize that many of the techniques we were talking about heavily overlap with this idea of architectural governance, and in particularly, the ability to automate a bunch of these architectural governance techniques. And so I'll show you a bunch of examples of that as we go along. So let's talk about definitions of things. We actually thought quite a bit about the name of this technique. Uh, we thought about continuous architecture, but we realized the world already has too many continuous things in the agile world, and we don't need another one of those. Uh, there's certainly an aspect of incrementalism in the way we talk about uh, evolutionary architecture, and I'll give you an example of that toward the end, but that's not all that's here. That's just one aspect of it, so you'll see that actually made it as part of our definition. Agile architecture is too broad, and in fact, you don't have to be doing agile software development to take advantage of these techniques. Some of the engineering practices make it easier, but it's not a prerequisite at all. Probably the closest thing that we thought about that didn't quite make the cut was adaptable architecture. But there's a really important distinction to be made here between adaptability versus evolution. When I say the word adaptable to a software architect, what they envision is the configuration dialogue in Eclipse or Visual Studio. This idea that we've created all these different possible pathways and we've created switches so you can adapt to one behavior versus the other. And this idea that we're going to take all the existing system and then keep adding to it by just adapting and adding new adapters and new proxies and that kind of stuff to it. Uh, that's not what we're talking about. In fact, that's an anti-pattern that we talk about in our book. This idea of ultimately adaptable software is a big giant anti-pattern. That's not what we're talking about here at all. We're talking about fundamental change over time, evolving the behavior of your system uh, because the world is changing and you need to change fundamental behavior, not continue to be backwards compatible for the rest of time. So let's talk about our definition. An evolutionary architecture supports a guided incremental change across multiple dimensions. And I'll talk about this definition in three parts. First part of which is guided. And this is, comes from uh, Rebecca, one of my co-authors, Dr. Rebecca Parsons, who's the ThoughtWorks CTO, but she also has a background in evolutionary computing. And that's really where the evolutionary part of evolutionary architecture comes from. So in the evolutionary computing world, you create genetic algorithms. And there are well-known techniques by which these genetic algorithms will mutate themselves through generations. So it'll produce a result, mutate itself in well-known ways, and produce a different result. If you're trying to design a genetic algorithm to produce some sort of beneficial outcome, every time it produces a result, you'd like to guide it and tell it, are you getting closer to the thing that I'd really like for you to create or way far afield and far away from it? The mechanism that's used in that world to make that assessment is called a fitness function. So in the evolutionary computing world, a fitness function is an objective way to measure, is this genetic algorithm producing a better or worse result through this generation of its work. So for example, a well-known problem in this world is the traveling salesman problem, where I have a salesman, I have a group of cities he needs to visit. Let's say that I was designing a genetic algorithm to solve the traveling salesman problem. The fitness function here would be the length of the route, because that's the thing I'm trying to optimize as much as possible by designing this algorithm. If I had a more complex problem, like a genetic algorithm trying to design something like an airplane wing, then my fitness function will be things like aerodynamic lift and materials cost and all these things that let me determine is this a better airplane wing design or not. That's this idea of an evolutionary computing fitness function. We've borrowed this concept and applied it to architecture to create this idea of an architectural fitness function. This is any mechanism that provides an objective integrity assessment of some architectural characteristic or combination of architectural characteristics. And one of the things that people get caught up in is this is some giant new framework that you can download somewhere. This actually encompasses a whole lot of existing mechanisms. And I'll show you lots of examples of these things in just a second. It's really anything that you can use to verify some characteristic of your architecture. This is the answer to the question I posed earlier. Rather than capturing all these characteristics in a spreadsheet somewhere, 
If instead you had captured them as fitness functions, you have not only the definition of those characteristics, but also a way to verify to see if they're still true or not. I'll show you lots of examples of these things in just a second, but I want to finish my definition first. So that's the guided part of our definition. The incremental part of our definition really has two aspects. One is how do you put things live in an incremental way? And I'll actually finish up this talk with uh, a, an example tool that allows you to do this. The other is how do you apply these fitness functions once you've created them? And this is where common agile engineering practices like continuous integration or continuous deployment come in. Uh, this is a great way to wire in fitness functions into continuous integration and continuous deployment to make sure that once you've established these criteria, they get run on a regular basis. But that's what we mean by incremental change. The last part of our definition talks about multiple dimensions. And this is really just the pragmatic awareness that you can't really talk about evolving a software system without talking about all the things that are going to be affected. And so you see in our definition here common kinds of architectural concerns like performance and scalability and legality, but also some things that you might not necessarily expect in something purely about architecture like security. There may be some security aspects of the way you design your architecture or the way you deploy your architecture that you might have to take into account and build fitness functions for. And you'll also notice here relational database design. You can't have an evolutionary architecture without also being able to evolve the relational database schema that's attached to it. So we have a chapter called Evolutionary Database Design, although the really richest resource on that is the book Refactoring Databases by Scott Amler and Promote Sadlage. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you look at the subtitle of that book, the subtitle is Evolutionary Database Design. And so it turns out it's a perfect companion book to building evolutionary architectures is the book subtitled Evolutionary Database Design because it turns out those two things definitely go hand in hand. So that's what we mean we talk about multiple dimensions. And so that now gives me enough to talk about the agenda for the rest of this talk. The First part of which is the definition of evolutionary architecture which you've just lived through. Now I'm going to give you a bunch more examples of guided change via fitness functions and also how this overlaps with this idea of uh, architectural governance. So here's our definition again of an architectural fitness function. Uh, this can be really any mechanism that gives you objective integrity assessment of some combination or single architectural characteristic. And we have a bunch of categories of these things that we've defined. Um, which I'll talk about in a second. Fitness functions encompass a lot of different mechanisms, some of which have been around for a long time. So I'll show you examples today of using code level metrics to define fitness functions. We can use unit tests. There's actually some unit testing libraries that facilitate this. Techniques like chaos engineering fit nicely into this idea of fitness functions. Also tools like a monitors. So all these things can be used to create these ideas of fitness functions. For categories of fitness functions, we've identified an atomic fitness function, just looked at one characteristic of architecture, whereas holistic looks at a combination of characteristics. Some of them are triggered, meaning they're run like unit tests or triggered by continuous integration or deployment pipeline, whereas some just run continuously in your architecture like monitors with thresholds set. So for example, a lot of monitoring tools will let you set thresholds so that if a request takes too long, it's not raising alarm. That's a fitness function for us, if that's an important architectural characteristic we're looking at. We'd like for most of these to be as automated as possible, just like we'd like most tests to be automated, but there's a manual aspect to some of these, and in fact, very often there's a combination of automated and manual. I'll show you an example of one of those in just a second. One important characteristic of our definition is that it has an objective outcome. But it doesn't have to have a static outcome, like a pass-fail for a unit test. It could be dynamic. For example, if I'm operating at high scale, I might be OK with a lower performance number, but I want that within a certain threshold. I don't want it to fall off a cliff. And so I may set up thresholds to say, well, if scale is at this level, I'm OK with performance being lower, but within a same, uh, the same boundary. So it's still objective, but it may be dynamic based on context. Some of these may be time-based fitness functions to, as reminders uh, for important things. One question we get is, are there any such thing as domain-specific fitness functions? And you'll notice here there's a heavy overlap 
between this idea of fitness functions and the kind of traditional unit functional and user acceptance testing that we see in the agile uh, development world. And there's a really good way to determine which is which here because there is a distinction between these. Architectural fitness functions are designed to check architectural characteristics. And so a good example of this is elasticity of users. So when a, a burst of users comes in, I want to spin up more instances of my services to meet that elastic request and then spin them back down. When that bursty request goes back down, that's commonly called elasticity in architecture. Um, so is that a fitness function or is it a unit or functional test? If I can describe the problem with no knowledge of the problem domain, then it's an architectural characteristic. So for example, elasticity, I don't care if they're catalog users or insurance applications users or streaming video users, it's just elasticity of users, so that's a fitness function. If I have to know anything about the problem domain, then it's a traditional unit functional or user acceptance test. And so that's the delineation. If it's purely about an architectural characteristic and I can state it purely in architectural terms without knowledge of the domain, then it's a fitness function, not one of these traditional tests. So let's look at some examples of these. This is probably still a bit abstract, so let's make this a little more concrete and show you some examples of these guys. And the first example I'll look at uh, is a triggered atomic, a couple, several triggered atomic fitness functions. Atomic meaning it looks at one characteristic of architecture and triggered means it's run like a unit test. And here's a good example of one. So let's say you're an architect and you're building a component-based system of some kind. One of the things you want to try to avoid in component-based systems are cyclic dependencies between your components, where one component talks to another component, which talks to a third one, which talks back to the original one. And this is a problem in platforms that have really powerful IDEs. Because you're coding along in Eclipse or Visual Studio and you reference some class that you've never referenced before. What does the IDE do for you? Pops up a dialog, says, you want me to auto import that for you? And you swat that dialog away so fast now you never even see it anymore. It's like a reflex action, like a sneeze when you see that dialog. If I came over five minutes later and said, did you just auto import something? You go, no, 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 I haven't auto imported anything for hours, I swear, I, I wouldn't just auto import something like that. Because it's just a reflex, but what it creates are tangles in your code base. And this creates a headache for architects because it now makes it harder to reuse any one of those because now they're all connected to one another. So as an architect, you can wire this fitness function into your code base. This is using actually a very old metrics tool in the Java world called jdepend, but it's aware of package structure. And you can write a test that says, basically, tell me if I have any cycles in my code base or not, and if I do fail this test. You can write a similar test in the .NET world using a tool called independ, which is a commercial tool, but does the same kind of analysis at the package or structure level. Here's another good example. Let's say that you have a persistence package or namespace, a web, and a util one. And it's OK for persistence and web to import util, but I never want util to import web. As an architect, you can write a rule that basically defines the semantics of how you want your packages and namespaces to talk to one another. Once you put this in place, if a developer accidentally creates this connection that breaks the semantics and try to check this in, it'll fail this unit test and it prevents this bad thing, this bad structural decay from ever entering into your code base. So here are two examples of very low level metrics based fitness functions. Let's look at one at a higher level of abstraction. It's still atomic, meaning it's looking at one thing in architecture and still triggered. But the example here is this idea of consumer-driven contracts, which is a very popular, common practice in architectures like microservices, where I have essentially autonomous teams making changes in any way they want to, but very often they need to pass information back and forth. So the problem I'm trying to protect here is how do I preserve the integrity of the integration points? Because if these teams are basically changing in any way they want, how do I make sure they don't break how they're integrated with one another? The common practice in this world is this idea of consumer-driven contracts. So the scenario here is the team on the left is the service provider to all three teams on the right with probably some overlapping bits of information. The idea of consumer-driven contracts is each of the teams on the right is going to put together a set of tests and hand to the team on the left 
And the team on the left promises, <coughs> excuse me, I will keep those tests green always. And so now it doesn't really matter if these guys change as long as it doesn't break these contracts and everything's okay. So if my provider changes and doesn't break anything, then nothing's harmed. If it does break one of these integration tests, then that becomes a placeholder for conversation. Let's get these teams together again and reestablish this contract so that we can continue basically working without having to think about each other all the time. We just get notified when something interesting breaks. So those are all examples of triggered atomic fitness functions. Let's look at a triggered holistic fitness function. This is one that looks at more than one architectural characteristic. So let's say that you're trying to achieve scale, and one of the ways you're doing that is by using caching, which allows you to achieve the scalability levels you want. And you have atomic fitness function that verifies that you can get to a certain level of scale. Let's say it's a medical system, and so you have Another security-based fitness function that looks for staleness of data and how long data remains on the screen. And when run in isolation, it works okay. But when you turn on caching, that means that the data stays too long on the screen and it starts failing the staleness. And so this is the idea of a holistic fitness function is one that looks at some combination. Because very often these architectural characteristics interact with one another and sometimes you want to test that interaction to make sure that they still work the way that you think they do. Atomic continuous fitness functions are check one characteristic of architecture, but they run continuously all the time. And so this is the realm of tools like monitors uh, and other DevOps-centric tools. For example, Nagios is a great example of a monitoring tool where you can set up thresholds. A common practice in architectures like microservices is to set up things like synthetic transactions to test performance in uh, production systems. <coughs> Excuse me. So for example, let's say that I was curious about performance of how long transactions take in my production system. The idea of a synthetic transaction is let's put, let's insert a transaction into our production system with a correlation ID tagged onto it so we can trace and find out all the instances that it goes to. You can also set up monitors to do things like, well, if it takes too long, uh, then start raising an alarm. That's an example of a fitness function. Uh, wired into uh, something like a monitor that just runs continuously and looking at some characteristic like that in your architecture. The last of these categorized examples like this are holistic continuous fitness functions. They run all the time. They look at multiple characteristics in your architecture. And the best example we have of one of these that's already commonly in use out in the world is Netflix's Chaos Monkey. And the eventual creation of the entire Simeon army from Netflix. I'm sure you're all familiar with this mechanism. When Netflix moved all their infrastructure to AWS, they worried about common problems that AWS introduces, like high latency and availability and a bunch of other things. So they created the Simeon Army to stress test all these different things that can break so that they knew their architecture would be resilient to it. There are a couple that I'm particularly interested in, though, from our standpoint of this idea of fitness functions. Uh, in fact, uh, this guy will show up a little bit later, the janitor monkey, uh, this guy with a broom. Uh, the janitor monkey is responsible for cleaning up resources that no one's using anymore, and he'll make an appearance again late in my talk. But the two that are really pertinent to us are the conformity monkey and the subclass of the conformity monkey, the security monkey. What the conformity monkey does, the architects at Netflix have defined a bunch of governance rules that they want to be enforced at the architectural level. One of those is that every service at Netflix responds correctly to all the restful verbs. And so one of the things the conformity monkey does when a new service shows up, and it actually does this continuously, is test to make sure it responds correctly to all these restful verbs. If it doesn't, it kicks it out of production. Now, many of you are architects who have systems that have restful verbs in them. Can you guarantee me right now that all of your RESTful endpoints are configured exactly correctly in your architecture? You can't, can you? But you'd like to be able to, wouldn't you? At Netflix, they can because they have a mechanism that checks to make sure all these things are true. The same is true with the security monkey. 
the security monkey constantly checks all these services to make sure they're not, don't have ports open they're not supposed to have open, that they are vulnerable to things like SQL injection and all these possible things that can happen because, not because the developer is malicious, just because details fall through the cracks unless you automate them. And this is a way that we've automated that governance around really important things like security and conformity within the architecture. So we also have this concept of a system-wide fitness function, which is the aggregation of all these fitness functions together. And it's not like one big giant unit test you can run and get a green or red bar. But we're starting to think that we can define architecture with a lot fewer words and a lot more tests and fitness functions. Because a fitness function gives you not only the definition, but a way to verify that definition at the same time. And that, of course, leads nicely into this overlap area of automating governance and protecting architectural characteristics uh, through governance. One of the things that we're trying to encourage in our book is to get architects away from vague, meaningless terms like this. Architects come down out of the ivory tower and they tell the developers, we want a maintainable code base. And then they drop the whiteboard marker and walk out of the room. And all the developers look at each other and go, well, what does that mean? Because there's nothing testable here. You could have a robust debate over drinks as to what does it take to create a maintainable code base. But if you drill one level deeper into this and start thinking about, well, what are the objective measures of a maintainable code base? You can start thinking about things that are actually objectively testable. Let's control the complexity of the functions or methods within our code base. Uh, let's control naming conventions throughout our code base. Let's control in afferent and efferent coupling. There are lots of tools we can write around that. Things like Postel's law about how we extend things. These are all testable characteristics of code bases. So let me give you an example of a fitness function. And this actually happened years ago, long before we used the term fitness function, but that's exactly what we would describe this as now. So I was working with a company that hired a lot of very junior developers, and they were concerned about code quality for these junior developers. This one junior developer had been given this task to, uh, there was a Java server-side component and a JavaScript browser component. This was for an insurance company in the US. And this developer was given a task that did something for all 50 states, and being a junior inexperienced developer, they ended up writing a method in Java that was essentially if state equals Alabama, then do something for Alabama, else if state equals Georgia, for all 50 states with this long, one big, horrible method. But when they tried to check this code in, the architects had put a fitness function in place to look for overly complex method, and they had a threshold set at 50. And I'll tell you exactly how they arrived at 50 for that threshold. There used to be a metrics tool in the Java world called crap for j and it would try to determine how crappy your Java code was by looking at a combination of code coverage and cyclomatic complexity. And if your cyclomatic complexity ever made it to 50, no amount of code coverage would make your code not crappy in the opinion of this tool. So that's the threshold they set for the sanity threshold for nothing beyond this so this developer tried to check it in and it failed. My friend Glenn Vandenberg has a great quote that bad developers will move heaven and earth to do the wrong thing. That the amount of ingenuity that terrible developers are put into creating train wrecks, if they take half that ingenuity and apply it to solving real problems, the world would be a better place, but that just doesn't happen. And so this being a bad developer, I thought, huh, well, let me check this code in. How can I solve? Oh, I know how to solve this problem. I'll just write that code in JavaScript instead on the front end. Bypass that annoying thing that's yelling at me on the back end. So that's what they did. They rewrote this thing in JavaScript, but the architects outsmarted them because they had a fitness function, cyclomatic complexity check on the JavaScript code too. And so now this junior developer in great frustration went to the architect and said, look, this stupid code base won't let me check anything in. And that's the day they learned about the strategy design pattern. And that you shouldn't write giant, huge methods like that in a code base. We're not trying to create an architecture police state here where architects have created all these interlocking, conflicting fitness functions that don't allow anybody to check things in. But what we are trying to do is automate at least a baseline of sanity. As architects, what's the most complex code in your code base right now? You don't really know, do you? You don't have a lot of control over that. 
And what this allows you to do is a technique that we refer to as herding governance. So let's say a group of enterprise architects, you get together and you say, okay, we're going to start tackling complexity. And you put this fitness function in place for 50, uh, nothing higher than 50 on every project. And out of 100 projects, 23 of them fail it. Now, though, this is an opportunity of what we call herding governance. So instead of a hard error, turn that into a warning and tell those teams, look, we're going to give you some time to clean this up before we turn it back into a hard error. So three months or six months or heat death of the universe minus 10 years or some number we can give you to clean all this stuff up. This finally gives you a good answer to a question that you often get. Because you go to a project manager and say, through no one's fault, technical debt has accrued in this code base and we need time to clean it up. And your project manager says, well, six months ago you came to me and said you needed time to clean up technical debt. Now you're back hat in hand again asking me for more time. How do I know you're not going to be back in six months asking for even more time? And how do I know you're not just playing with shiny things and not actually cleaning stuff up like you say you are? This gives you evidence of progress. Because if you turn this fitness function on and 23 projects fail it, and then six months later only five fail it, you can point to that and say, look, we have demonstrable progress and we'll never have to slay that dragon again. Because we're going to leave that fitness function in place. And so this kind of swell of technical debt and then beat it down and then swell, now we're going to put a cap on it forever around that dimension of our code base. And the next time we tackle something, we'll tackle a different aspect and build a fitness function around that and gradually clean things up and then not let them get out of control again. There's some really great tools that allow you to do this sort of stuff. There's a great tool in the Java space called ArcUnit, which is inspired by JUnit. This will let you handle some common headaches in the architecture space, like lazy developers who throw generic exceptions. Now you can tell them they can't anymore, because this prevents them from throwing generic exceptions. What about the case where you've, as an organization, decided to use a third-party lo uh, logging package? What's to prevent them from using the built-in Java logging? This is what prevents them from using the built-in Java logging. You put a fitness function in place that prevents them from using the built-in stuff and forces them to use the, uh, the standardized stuff. Here's naming conventions. Uh, for example, no interfaces should have names ending with the word interface, which is a common annoyance for architects. So you can control things like naming conventions. But here's a deeper example. Let's say that you design a layered architecture like this with a presentation layer and a business layer and a data layer. As an architect, you design those layers for good reason. But when you hand this over to developers to implement, how can you make sure that they're not going to cheat? For example, maybe the reporting team decides, ah, it's taking too long to make requests through all those layers. I'm going to go directly from the presentation layer right to the database. That's a disaster architecturally because it invalidates the reason of creating all those layers. Here's a test. Oops, I went one too far there. Let me go back. Look at this middle test. No classes that reside in a package service should access classes that reside in a package controller. This implements that governance rule. Now, many of you as architects have written almost exactly that same English sentence in a wiki or some terrible SharePoint portal somewhere and it was right once read never by another human being. You wrote it there for good reason because this is a principle that we want to implement in our architecture, but it's just too hard to remember all these principles as developers. When you write them somewhere in an architecture decision record or a wiki or somewhere, there's no teeth. If you write them as tests and wire them into the build, then developers can't ignore these things anymore because you've codified not only my intent, but also the verification of that intent at the same time. Here's an example of a uh, arc unit building a custom rule that says I can't call this library or this particular class except through a wrapper class. You could build all kinds of elaborate governance rules here. So sometimes this is finding really slick tools like arc unit, but sometimes this is just figuring up ways to wire things together in useful ways. And here's a good example. 
I was doing some consulting work for this financial services company just outside Manhattan, and they were using several open source libraries and frameworks, and one of the lawyers got worried about viral licenses in open source frameworks and libraries, that if you adopt that license, it forces you to adopt a too liberal a license, and so we chased down all the licenses for all those things, and let the lawyers look at them, make sure they were okay. And then one of the lawyers asked a really awkward question. What happens if one of these libraries updates their license terms as part of a software update? And being a good lawyer, he had in his back pocket a case where this had happened in the past. The QT user interface library did a fundamental change to their license during a minor software update. And so, OK, now this is something we have to check for. So here's the mechanism we wired up. We knew the location for that license file and all those libraries and frameworks, so we took the entire license file, hashed it, and stuck that value in a database. And now, anytime one of these libraries updates itself, we hash the license file, compare that to the value in the database, and if that's changed, we call a lawyer. Okay, come look at this new one, make sure it's okay. If it is, we'll anoint that one, we'll hash that one, that becomes the latest value in the database. So basically what we've done is built a mechanism in our project that's monitoring changes to those license files. And anytime one of them changes, then it tells you so you can address it. But this is common to a lot of these governance things. It's really just a heartbeat on your project. It's basically going, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Whoops, it's broken, come fix me. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. But see, the problem with not having that as an architect is your whole life is spent going, is it okay? Is it okay? Is it okay? I've got to go check. Okay, it's okay. Is it okay? Is it okay? Is it? I've got to go check. Okay, it's okay. There's this constant low-level stress because you don't know. Having that heartbeat there means that if that breaks, it'll tell me and I can go fix it, but now I don't have to worry about it breaking because it's just there. This is the beauty of building something like... Um, the Simian Army, there's a whole class of things that they don't worry about from an architecture standpoint because they know there's a mechanism checking on those things all the time to make sure they don't break. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's talk about putting this into practice. The first step, of course, is identifying what dimensions. Now, notice I don't say identifying what dimensions you think are going to change because you can't predict what's going to change. But what this does allow you to do is do a better job of prioritizing what do we really need to support in our architecture. This also gives you a much more concrete way to ascern what does it cost to implement and maintain particular architectural characteristics. Now I can say what does performance cost in this architecture? Performance costs what it takes for me to implement and maintain the performance fitness function. Because now I know that performance is going to be maintained for the life of this application because I have a real-time check running all the time in my ecosystem. This also changes this variable fix-it cost that's going to happen at some point in the future to a constant maintenance cost. Because what happens a lot of times, we pick a particular framework because of performance or some characteristic we want, and we check it on an ad hoc basis, and it gradually degrades over time, and then there's a bunch of work that has to be done to retrofit it and fix it again. That's that variable fix-it cost lurking in the future. That changes this to a constant maintenance cost because if you keep that fitness function maintained, then you never get surprised by one of these things falling off a ledge somewhere. Once you've identified and prioritized the dimensions you want to support in your architecture, then you can define fitness functions for them. Um, this is the guardrails that you create for your architecture over time to make sure that all those things behave the, the way that you want them to. And then use deployment pipelines and or continuous fitness functions to wire this up to make sure that things still work correctly. This is definitely something that you do initially as you start a project uh, because that's when you identify what kind of architectural pattern you want to support. But it's also meant to be an ongoing living part of your code base. You update these things just like you update unit tests and functional tests. This is really the definition of those uh, software architectural characteristics. And so you update these aggressively just like you do uh, any kind of other uh, verification mechanism like tests. So the last thing I'll talk about is this idea of incremental change, uh, both at the operational side and at the development side. 
Uh, obviously, mechanisms like deployment pipelines are great tools to allow you to automate uh, wiring together things like fitness functions into builds. And in fact, there's a great benefit here because it allows you to create an, an automation, a governance platform. So here's a question for you guys. What happens right now in your organization when there's a zero day security exploit for one of the frameworks or libraries you are using to do development? This is not an abstract question. This happened to a big financial services company in the US and what did they do? Their security people ran around looking for instances and they found a bunch of them. And a bunch of them fell through the cracks and they're still dealing with the exposure that that caused. Imagine a world for a second where every one of your projects was running continuous integration or deployment pipeline, and your security team had a slot in every project's deployment pipeline where they can insert code if they need to. Probably all they're doing on a regular basis is making sure you're not checking passwords into version control and things like that. But when that zero day security exploit comes out, they can insert a test in everyone's build that says if you're using the affected version of this framework, fail your build and notify the security team. Let's let you automate these kind of governance activities so that they stop falling through the cracks. Once you've created that level of automation, you basically created a platform that you can rely on to handle critical things like this for you. So let's talk about the operational side of incremental change and putting things live. So let's say that we have a website for penultimate widgets and it has a star rating service that people, that other services use to star rate things. And one day we put out a better version of star ratings. We don't force anyone to start using it. It's just now a new capability in our architecture. And so over time, other teams that need star ratings will eventually start using the new and improved star rating service until eventually no one's pointing to the old one anymore. One of the uh, lessons that Netflix taught us about architectures like this is you monitor not only the services, but also the routes between services. And any service that has been routed to in a set amount of time automatically gets disintegrated out of the architecture. Anybody remember whose job that is? It's our friend, the janitor monkey. That's exactly what he does, is get rid of services that we don't need anymore. So my last example here is a case study from the GitHub engineering blog called Move Fast and Fix Things. It's a great example of this idea of incremental uh, change at the architectural level. These guys are an extremely agile engineering organization. They do continuous deployment. They average 60 deploys a day. And this case study is about a problem they had with merge. It turns out that since day one at GitHub, the way they've merged two projects is to shell out to a shell script, have it merge those things, and then suck it back into GitHub. The problem is that doesn't scale particularly well, and so they had to bite the bullet and write their own in-memory version of merge, which they did. But now here comes the problem, they need to put it live. But they don't want to create any structural instabilities. You can't break merge, it's always worked perfectly. And so they created an open source, this a tool called Scientist, and have ported it to a bunch of other languages. Scientist allows you to conduct experiments. So when you hit the Scientist block, you can set up a threshold. They set up 1% for this merge experiment. It always executes use, which is the old code, and returns it to the user. But in 1% of the cases, it also executed this try code, randomizes the order, measures duration, swallows and records exceptions, and publishes all this stuff to a dashboard. So here's right after they deployed the experiment. At 2.20, they're doing a little over 2,000 experiments. If you look at the bottom, you can see some tiny red tick marks, which is where use and try disagreed. So if you zoom in on the bottom, you can see here are places where they have bugs in their new code. Hasn't had an impact on users yet, because they always get the use part of this block back. They were also testing performance. And so here is the performance graph. The green line is the new code, and the blue line is the old code. They ended up running this experiment for four days, until they had 24 hours with no mismatches or slow cases. Over the course of those four days, they did more than 10 million comparisons, so they had really high confidence that that new code was doing exactly what they wanted when they stripped the old code away and left the new code in place. A great example of incremental change at the architectural level, making structural changes without creating instabilities around that change. 
So we have the book, Building Evolutionary Architectures. We also have a companion website where we're continuing to add more resources and a bunch of exercises and a bunch of other stuff to illustrate these concepts. Uh, so we're continuing to add material uh, to the website, so uh, feel free to go there and get more resources about this. Thanks very much for coming, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks.